So thanks for having me. This is about overall how hardware startups get into YC as a side note, but really generally kick ass. It's far from one formula. It's far from the only way to do things. It's something that I think has worked decently well for me and some other companies. So big caveat to start, I am an extremist. This is my home. It's a shipping container off grid in West Oakland. Like I am about as bootstrapped with most things as you can get. So if I give you advice, it is not mainstream VC or early stage fundable company track advice. It's about making things work, bootstrapping most of the time as I've for most of the companies that I've started. And occasionally, sometimes that overlaps with something interesting enough to scale. So caveat. Y Combinator is best represented by our portfolio companies. These are some of the most famous, all very cool companies, all software. These are the terms that we typically do, 120K, and we take essentially 7% of your company. We've funded 940 so far. Our market cap is about 65 billion. We had 107 companies in our last batch. We do two batches per year. What you might not have realized is that in last batch, out of our 99 companies that ended up presenting, we had 20 that were hardware companies. We have so many you can't even coherently fit them onto a slide anymore. So real quick, why not to do a startup? Don't do it because it's trendy. Don't do it as something to pad your resume. Certainly don't do it to maximize your wealth. Like go down to Wall Street if that's what you're about. Why not to do hardware, whether as a startup or overall? You have to be really comfortable with large machinery and equipment. This is one section of one floor of the large machinery and equipment section of the Canton Fair outside of Shenzhen. And you have to deal with a lot of inconvenience things, inconvenient things with hardware, none of which are real barriers to doing it, all of which take more time and sometimes energy than software. Only real good reason to do a hardware startup at these two overlapping points of difficulty is to change the world. It shows all signs of continuing to be made of physical things and we have a lot of opportunity to use a startup as our lever of Archimedes to create real things in the real world that really move the needle. So with all of those out of the way, this is the easy to state, difficult to execute magic formula that I would present to all of you for how to succeed at doing a hardware startup. Make things, show them to people, iterate, sell them to people, grow, tell people about it, and fail. And I'm gonna give you examples of how seven hardware companies from our most recent batch have done all of these before Y Combinator. They of course continue to, but even before getting into YC, they've all done this to large degrees. So first, until you make something, whether it's software or hardware, you're a person with an idea. And any meetings you have, that is the context that me or anyone else who might in some way help your startup will have. You will be a person who is kind of smart, who like a friend of a friend introduced, who has an idea. That is not that interesting. Everybody has ideas, especially for hardware, where everyone is saying, like if you ask anyone, they wanna do a startup. Everyone wants to do a startup. It's the cool thing now. But until you physically make a thing that someone can hold, you are just another smart person with an idea. So Bodyport wrote an application for Y Combinator. They told us they were smart people with an idea to make a scale that could measure your blood pressure through your feet within like five seconds. But more intriguingly, they had actually made something. So this is Bodyport at Demo Day, revision like 20 of their scale, taking medically accurate blood pressure readings. So they even in their application, even in their interview, differentiated themselves from like 95% of the hardware applications we see because they'd actually started to make something. It sounds simple, but it's a huge step to differentiate you from so many other people. Secondly, unless you're just going to make like artisan furniture in your garage only for you, really helps to actually show people what you are making and get feedback on it. Great example is T-Bot. T-Bot is a machine you put in the corner of your cafe or cafeteria or wherever, and it creates custom blends of tea, 16 different flavors and 10% increments of mixing to the exact temperature specification that you want. 
before even applying to YC. T-Bot built this a mile from their school in Canada, installed it, and was getting feedback from thousands and thousands of users. So they were very quickly figuring out what worked, what didn't, what customers liked, what customers didn't like. There's no excuse, like, people spend so much time as startups taking meetings with people like us when really they should just be outside showing their product to people like the actual customers who will buy their product. And then, and constantly, iteration. Unless you are the most magical entrepreneur in the world, the first 50 versions of what you make are not going to achieve product market fit. You should approach all of this as you are making and showing things as part of a process. There's not grand reveals for startups. You are not Apple. You do not have a magical demo day where you present your perfectly finished product for the world to order, take it or leave it. You can do that. Many startups do and many startups go out of business. A great example of this is a company called Nebia. We met Nebia and they told us they were going to and had in fact started making and had made about 20 versions of a better shower head. Fast forward several months, they've launched successfully on Kickstarter, pre-sold over $3 million of a shower head that after you take a shower, you too will pay $400 for a shower head that's the best looking thing in your bathroom and uses 30% as much water as any other shower head you can buy. So this, is, this was early, this was like, I'm sure they have five more tables like this by now. Approaching this as an iterative process rather than this binary grand reveal like where you go through phases. That's what big companies do. That's why startups can outcompete them. We don't have phases. We don't have development cycles that follow linear time frames. We move quickly, break things, make lots of things and iterate upon them. A really important step that people tend to sometimes forget, especially in times of hype when you can sell a company to Facebook or someone else making hardware without shipping hardware, it helps to actually have customers who will pay you money. It's an important step if you are building a business. A great example of this is a company that didn't get much press from our last batch because they were pretty much just quietly executing. My friend Brian started Transcend Lighting and it was really easy for us to figure out that we should interview him for Y Combinator because he had built this because his dad wanted to grow more, more than a couple seedlings indoors. It's an LED light that's drastically more power efficient, so high ROI for anyone growing food or other things indoors and he just kind of started selling. He got feedback from initial users, put a buy now button on it and much to his surprise and delight, one of his early versions, people started to buy it. Fast forward, he's now selling three different versions, all of which are high margin and you know, it's an industrial thing, not something that is making all of the headlines like some of our other companies, but just a solid business where he is actually selling product to happy customers who pay high margins above his cost to make it. And then, unless it's just a hobby business, you really need to be showing strong growth. Great example, literally and figuratively, is Click and Grow. Their first product launched in 2013, so years before they participated in our most recent batch. It's a beautiful little indoor herb garden. So you put it in your kitchen and you can grow oregano or basil or other very basic things. You plug it into the wall, put water in it, and that's about it. They sell cartridges, so very much a cool razor and blade financial model. You get little packets of soil and the, th the seeds for what you're growing in the mail, and that was all well and good. What made us really excited about them was the growth that they'd shown year over year with that product, but also that they'd learned enough from that initial product to, over the course of YC, start taking pre-orders for their new product, their Smart Farm, which is several hundred dollars and grows in your kitchen while remaining a usable countertop, a substantial portion of the fresh greens that your family will eat. So growing, selling more of your existing product and then really learning from that and not, again, not considering this a linear one product process, but really something that's iterative and that grows into a suite of related products is much more interesting and exciting for you and for us. 
And then you have to tell people about it. It's not enough to just be growing. You really have to, if you're going to build a high growth, high margin startup, you have to have a compelling story around it. If you don't have a compelling story, you are sooner rather than later a commodity. And in some cases, vice versa. If you have a commodity product with really great stories behind it, you can do what Talia did with L. We had a condom company in our last batch and we had it because Talia's built this amazing brand behind her beautifully packaged product. She's done such a good job of this that when she releases a new marketing video, like to be clear, very much an advertisement for her product, it's a news headline. Magazines pick that up and write articles about her new marketing videos. So really telling a cohesive story is all that differentiates any hardware from sooner rather than later becoming a commodity. And then often overlooked and not embraced nearly as much as it should be, you have, to, you have to expect to fail. If you're not, and this is not figurative, like be okay with it, not pivot, fail. Pivot, I, I would like to just delete that word. We need to embrace this idea that sometimes things don't work and that's okay. Great example of that, my friends at Luna created several years ago a smart mattress cover. And they, I think in 2013 was the first time that they pitched it to us and we rejected them. So they went out, pre-sold a substantial number on Indiegogo and we accepted them. Anytime I see an applicant who's applied more than once, I really wanna read their application closely. If they've shown material progress, then you know they're kind of going to do something whether or not we get involved. You know, it's a moving train at that point. They've embraced failure, whether it's rejection by us or changing what product they're building, and they continue the process. And you know, they're not exactly stressed out by the failures, by the failures along the way at Demo Day recently. So you know, it's really easy to tell you about. It's a lot harder to execute upon. But I would argue that this is pretty much the formula for building a successful business. It's a no-brainer, and frankly. There's a whole lot of other stuff people can tell you to do. Like all of this, you should just probably ignore. You should ignore any advice that I or anyone else gives you that is materially different than what you would do if it was just you maxing out your credit card. Like you're spending every cent and then all the credit you have access to to start your business. If someone's telling you to do something that you wouldn't do in that scenario, it should be a really compelling reason and you should be very skeptical about their advice. Or to put it another way, Make things people want. It's really, at the end of the day, it's that simple and that complicated. So we have applications for our current class open now. I encourage all of you to apply. If you're making a physical thing and have a prototype, please email me. I'd be happy to see it and give you honest feedback on it. Thanks for having me and look forward to your questions. So I didn't believe this when I heard this when I was applying to Y Combinator like with my company that went through but we have no quotas of any kind. We don't even, we kind of have gravitated towards 100 to 120 in recent batches overall but we don't have any like this many biotech or this many hardware. We are seeing a greater percentage of hardware in our most recent batches. I would strongly argue there are just more compelling early stage hardware startups being founded and we see a lot of the companies that are being founded overall. Okay. And it's hardware broadly defined? It's, it's compelling startups with fierce okay. founders broadly. Yeah, no quotas of any kind. Exactly. Okay, very cool. And uh, so what, what do you guys um, offer during the program? How do you, because hardware is a little different, so it's um, probably more education, uh, it's a sort of so we're not and this is very different than most people that fund hardware we don't have in-house resources I had a ten thousand dollar budget to build out a mini lab which essentially is some soldering stations a reflow oven and a couple 3d printers like last minute you drop something it broke right before you're demoing to an investor or something you can probably repair it there a couple spare arduinos very minimalist and we don't have like in-house technical deep talent for you to utilize we would rather have startups ship a kickstarter a couple weeks later and instead develop their own ecosystem both of skills internally and 
preferred vendors that we can recommend to them, not because they're our buddies, but because 20 previous startups have successfully worked with them and all given us positive feedback about them. And I guess people can ask you directly, but uh, what, what's, what's the actual process? So you, you apply online and then you have an interview? Is that, how, does, how, does that work? Hmm? how long does it take from start to finish? So you apply online, applications are open like another month or so. Um, and then there's late. Don't apply late. Apply sooner rather than later. It makes you slightly more likely to get in. Um, and then some proportion of companies get invited for an interview. If you get invited for an interview, we pay for your team's travel, your founding team's travel, to come to interview in person in Mountain View. And then that evening, you find out whether you are offered a spot or not. So no ambiguity, no delay. In California, if you're a New York company, you do whatever you want. You can stay there, or you can just come back to New York. Exactly. We, really pretty much need, I mean, we require you to be based in California during the program. Some people split time. We had a drone company recently, Flirty, that had made a lot of progress in New Zealand, so they were back and forth a lot. Laws were a little different there. I think we'll see that increasingly with biotech companies that, for regulatory and market acceptance reasons, kind of split their time, like a lot of time in Thailand or China and a little NYC. Okay. Uh, cool. Come on, no questions. Here we go. You said to avoid contract manufacturers. How do you recommend against them, Bill? Um, I have, I, so the question was, you said avoid contract manufacturers. How do you recommend you get stuff built? At the early stages with you know, this and this, um, or someone higher cost and quicker. I want companies to fully ignore their bomb on their first units, as counterintuitive as that sounds. Like, you need to not be using unobtainium to make what you're making, but building with a dev kit and getting it into users' hands sooner rather than later, even if you're building a product that's gonna sell for 100 bucks and your dev kit costs 500, like you shouldn't care. It's not worth your time to optimize. Later, you'll get to play with all of those fun things in the tag cloud. So the question was, how does it benefit hardware if you already, other than brand and access to network, et cetera, if you already have a working prototype when you get in? To be clear, not everyone has a working prototype. Some work, I'd say the majority have some progress. Like mine, for example, I did a soil sensor that went through YC and it worked like kind of a little bit. The battery life was like 10 minutes rather than infinite and solar powered like we would get it to eventually. But. Um, you should have some progress when you're seeking any type of funding or obviously when you're selling something to people. So I'd argue that's kind of like systemically, if you're seeking funding as a hardware company, you should have something to show. You can spend a lot more time and get a lot worse terms, in my opinion, by you know trying to fundraise rather than building to where you have something, some proof of concept. And I mean, I think the benefit of YC is like the benefit of any type of network of advice and amount of capital, except more extreme. You can send out an email about FCC certification recommendations for a lab, and this happened this week. A couple days later, from our hardware alumni, you will get back 10 recommendations for places that people have actually used and advice on how to approach them and who to talk to. So it's, there's no one grand thing. We're not a magic formula for software or hardware. We're a lot of advice, some of which is, I think, very good, and a very strong alumni network who have started some of the most interesting companies of the last decade. Can you guys do like crowdfunding or everything else? Can you a company that has done a crowdfunding campaign is uh, at an advantage that hasn't? I think, I, I mean, I like anything, anything that moves you from, you know, here is thing that everyone is using in $10 billion company, like at one extreme, guy with an idea at the other extreme, anything that gets you along that path, whether it's pre-sales, whether it's getting, you know, B2B sales and eventually doing B2C, whatever it is. But yeah, we like companies either during the batch, as Nebia did, or before to sell, I mean, we like companies to sell product. If you have product to sell, whether it's hardware or software, you should be selling it way sooner than you're comfortable with, and that goes a lot further than any you know, market analysis or any of this other stuff you can do other than make things that people want and sell it to them. <laughs> 
Uh, all right, that's all we have. Thank you very much. Thanks.